My name is Eric Gutag. Greetings to those of you who have endured a year like no other in America, at least since our last major pandemic over a century ago. And welcome to my Black History Month talk for 2021, which is entitled The Black George C. Marshall, General and Secretary of State Colin Powell. In my in three of my earlier talks, I've discussed the contributions of black Americans to our military. As I observed in 2014, African Americans have fought in all our major conflicts. In that talk, I focused on the contribution of African Americans, soldiers in our Civil War. Upwards of 180,000 African Americans were in uniform, about 10% of the total Union Army. They sacrificed much, including their lives, for equality. An unfortunate carryover from the Civil War was that black units in our military were still commanded by white officers. My 2017 talk discussed the Buffalo Soldiers, mounted black units normally led by white officers. Their primary adversary were Native American tribes, but they would also have to endure an often hostile white, local white populace they were charged to protect. By the way, you'll hear about the Buffalo Soldiers again later. Sadly, up through the end of World War II, the American military remained segregated into black and white units. My first talk in 2011 on General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., who commanded the old black Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. They became the 332nd Fighter Group, the famous as well as feared Red Tails. They were named for the vertical stabilizer of their P-51 Mustangs painted a distinctive red. Davis was the first African American to become a Brigadier General in the U.S. Air Force. At West Point, there are pictures of outstanding graduates. One was of Davis with the notation, World War II hero helped to integrate the Air Force. Speaking of integration, I observed in my 2011 talk that President Truman in 1948 officially ended segregation in the U.S. Armed Forces. He instituted a policy of equal treatment and opportunity for all races serving in our military. Instituting such a policy is one thing but making it happen is a whole different matter. The subject of my talk this year is a role model of what an integrated and fully equal American military should look like. But first, let's consider another legendary American general of the 20th century, who was a titan as both a military and civilian leader. In 1939, General George C. Marshall became the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. During World War II, he would coordinate the American military effort against the Axis powers. By its end, he, be, he had become a five-star General of the Army. That rank has been issued to only eight other American military officers, none since 1981. In his civilian career, Marshall would be Truman's Secretary of State from 1947 to 1949. His efforts in rebuilding a war-torn Europe was known as the Marshall Plan, for which he would receive the Nobel Prize in 1953. During the Korean War, he became Truman's Secretary of Defense. To this day, Marshall is the only American, civilian or military, to have served as secretary in both of these cabinet level offices. Marshall had the benefit of being a scion of an old Virginia family. The subject of my talk this year had no such advantage based upon his race, class, or ancestors. Nonetheless, General Colin L. Powell had an extensive and exceptional military and civilian career that rivals and perhaps exceeds that of Marshall. Like Marshall, who graduated from VMI, Powell was not a West Pointer. But unlike Marshall, Powell's achievement during his career required overcoming a significant hurdle, namely being an African American of first generation immigrants.
The story of this outstanding American patriot and leader began inauspiciously on August, or excuse me, April 5, 1937, when he was born in the Harlem district of New York City. Colin Luther Powell was the youngest child and only son of two first-generation Jamaican immigrants. His father, Luther Theophilus Powell, worked as a shipping clerk and later foreman. His mother, Maud Ariel McCoy Powell, known as Ari, worked as a seamstress. Starting in 1941, his family moved to Hunts Point in South Bronx. Powell's childhood up through high school would be spent in what was known as the Banana Kelly neighborhood. It took its name from the main thoroughfare in the South Bronx on which the Powell family lived, Kelly Street, which was curved like the shape of a banana. As described by Powell, it was heavily Jewish, mixed with Irish, Polish, Italian, Black, and Hispanic families. A number of Powell's aunts and uncles also lived nearby. The advent of World War II would change how Powell pronounced his name. Prior to World War II, Powell's first name was standardly pronounced Colin in the British and Jamaican fashion. But when Colin P. Kelly posthumously received the Distinguished Service Cross for attacking a Japanese battleship, he became Colin of Kelly Street. Unlike his older, more studious sister, Powell characterized himself as a happy-go-lucky kid, amenable, amiable, and aimless. He attended Morris High School, where, when you show up, they have to let you in. Neither athlete nor scholar, he would soak up the calypso music of his Jamaican heritage. At St. Margaret's, an Anglican church his family attended, Powell became an acolyte, joyfully swinging the incense burner and lustily chanting, Amen. When he went to church camp one summer, Powell would demonstrate both his mischievous as well as truthful character. He and some of his buddies snuck out to buy some beer. When that was discovered, the priest summoned the campers for an inquisition. Powell was the first to confess guilt, with two other boys following his example. Powell was sent home in disgrace. Even so, he was redeemed when his parents were called and told that Cohen had stood up and took responsibility, spurring the other boys to admit guilt. As Powell described it from Juvenile delinquent, I had been catapulted to hero. Something from that boy, boyhood experience, the rewards of honesty, hit home and stayed. Powell would graduate from Morris High School in 1954, the same year as Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which ruled against segregation in public schools. During his youth, he had, a, had no sense of racial identity or that he belonged to a minority. Instead, Powell was to taste the poison of bigotry much later and far from Banana Kelly. The closest Powell came to the question of race was when his older sister brought home her boyfriend, Norman Burns, in 1952. Norm was white and Marilyn wanted to marry him. Such an interracial marriage raised concerns with his parents, especially his father. But after going to see Norm's folks in Buffalo, they found them a little more tolerant than the pals. Marilyn and Norm would be married in August 1953. After graduating from high school, the indifferent student, Colin, moved onto the campus of nearby City College of New York. For the nominal fee of $10 per year, CCNY was known to provide higher education for the children of the working class. He would start out as an engineering major, but when asked to draw a cone intersecting a plane, his mind went blank. So he switched to geology as his major, which both perplexed and disappointed his parents. What truly created enthusiasm in Powell at CCNY was its ROTC program, which he enrolled in his sophomore year. When he put on the uniform and looked in the mirror, he liked what he saw. 
He would also join the elite military fraternity at CCNY, the Pershing Rifles. As a member of the Pershing Rifles, he would become captain of its drill team and in his senior year, its cadet, its, its cadet colonel. In the summer between his junior and senior years, Powell journeyed to Fort Bragg in North Carolina for ROTC summer training. Fort Bragg was his ethnic awakening as he met whites who were not Poles, Jews, or Greeks. Even so, for six weeks, he trained isolated from Southern life. He was named best cadet for his company as well as second best cadet for his entire group. As his reward, he got a death set that would travel with him throughout his 35 year military career. Powell's experience in the Pershing Rivals determined his pursuit of a military career after CCNY. It provided the discipline, the structure, the camaraderie, the sense of belonging that he craved. What he also found was a selflessness within our ranks that reminded me of the caring atmosphere within my family. Race, color, background, income meant nothing. The Pershing Rifles would go the limit for each other and for the group. If this is what soldiering was all about, then maybe I wanted to be a soldier. In 1958, Powell would graduate from CCNY as a distinguished military graduate. That meant he could receive a regular rather than reserve commission. Even though it meant an additional year of active service, he eagerly accepted the regular Army commission. His military career as a second lieutenant of infantry started in the, in the summer of 1958 at Fort Bevings, Benning in Georgia. During ranger training, he had to overcome the slide for life, which tested our willingness to obey what seemed like suicidal orders. It required grabbing onto a hook attached to a pulley that slid on a cable. Only a dozen feet from the tree to which the cable was attached did he get the order to drop in one of the most frightening experiences of his life. That would be followed by airborne training with which required equally terrifying drops, first from a 250 foot high jump tower, then from a C-123 transport. Surviving these rites of passages, passage qualified Powell as an airborne ranger. Powell was initially posted to German, West Germany as a platoon leader in an infantry company of an armored unit. At that time, the Cold War with the Soviet Union was very chilly. The American military in Europe expected the Red Army to invade West Germany at any moment. As Powell adroitly expressed it, once the Russians started coming, we were to fight like the devil, fall back, and watch the nuclear cataclysm begin. During his time in Europe, he also came across a grimy, weary-looking sergeant who saluted him and put out his hand. As he would tell his astonished children later, that non-com was none other than Elvis Presley. After a two-year stint overseas, Powell was assigned January of 1961 to Fort Devens in Massachusetts. As a first lieutenant, he became the executive officer of an infantry company. While in Massachusetts, he would meet his soulmate for life, Alma Johnson from Birmingham on a blind double date. As I noted in my talk last year, Birmingham was notoriously segregated well into the 1960s. In fact, Alma never liked her hometown, finding it stifling and wanting to see more of the world. As Powell described it, Alma and I became inseparable. But in the summer of 1962, he found out he was going to Vietnam. The dilemma was his budding romance with Alma. After some soul searching in his bunk one night, he asked Alma to marry him. She said yes, and on August 25, 1962, they were wed in Alma's hometown.
Soon after getting married, Powell went overseas to Vietnam. Now a captain, he arrived Christmas morning of 1962 in Saigon. He was assigned as an American advisor to a South Vietnamese Arvin Infantry Battalion at the Ao Chau Valley along the Laotian border. He eventually became friends with the commander of this battalion, Captain Vo Cong Hu. Pao Hu and this Arvin Battalion spent their time patrolling and looking for the Viet Cong, also known as the VC. The tropical forest enclosing the trails they moved along made ambush by the VC likely. Those trails could also be booby-trapped with snares and poison punji spikes. Indeed, the first ca casualty that Powell witnessed was a soldier who stepped onto a punji spike. Over time, Powell tried to blend in with the Arvin. He would jot down his experiences in a notebook he carried. Sadly, one of Powell's entries involved a friendly fire incident when hidden VC fired at Marine helicopters. When the Arvin returned fire, one of those helicopters, believing the R VC had been spotted, blazed away with its machine guns. But instead of hitting any VC, that machine gun fire wounded or killed several Arvin in Powell's column. Having been ambushed repeatedly, Powell tried unsuccessfully to get his Arvin colleagues to wear armored vests. He finally persuaded Hugh to have his point squad wear these vests, which was considered cumbersome. One day, the front of their column was fired upon, which then returned fire. But this time, without the screams and groans of our casualties. Instead, Powell heard laughter. The point man was wearing a vest dented in back with an embedded bullet. Powell pried out the bullet and showed it to prove his point about the life-saving value of those vests. From that time on, he had no trouble getting his armored comrades to wear them. Hugh was eventually replaced by Captain Kime, who failed to connect with his men and did not know how to use advisors. One day when the VC dropped mortar rounds into their encampment, Kime brashly ordered return fire even though Powell told him this response might not be wise. As Powell expected, that only caused the VC to zero their mortar rounds on them and wound many Arvin soldiers, including Kime. The day after the mortar attack, Powell received a letter from his mother that he was now a father. Michael Kevin Powell had been born on March 23, 1963. Two months later, he learned his next assignment would be the Infantry Officer's Advanced Course at Fort Benning with a potential early promotion to Major. But on July 23, while on patrol, he stepped on a feared punji spike which pierced his butt boot and foot. Soon in excruciating pain, he was airlifted to Hue and pumped full of antibiotics. He recovered quickly, earning a Purple Heart, but also ending his days as an advisor to the Arvin. Back in Saigon, Powell witnessed on November 1 the bloody turmoil that signified the coup that overthrew the South Vietnamese President Diem. Even so, the view by the Secretary of Defense McNamara at that time was that we are winning the war. But as observed by Powell, nothing he had witnessed in the Ao Chau Valley indicated we were beating the VC. Despite his misgivings, Powell left Vietnam still a true believer in helping South Vietnam. Yet when he asked what jo the job would take, Powell responded off the cuff, half a million men. He was sadly to discover later how low his estimate was for how many American soldiers would eventually be committed to the Vietnam conflict. Powell came back from Vietnam to an America that was starting to convulse politically and racially. Two events in the fall of 1963 signified turbulent times ahead. As noted in my talk last year, on September 15 in his wife's hometown, the infamous 16th Street Baptist Church bombing occurred, which injured 22 people as well as killing four young girls. On November 22, 
Powell was sitting in an airport in Nashville when President Kennedy was assassinated. As he described it, I had returned home, it seemed, to a world turned upside down. After taking the infantry officer's advanced course at Fort Benning, Powell graduated third overall. But in looking for housing for his family, he would find the South's segregated society tough to swallow. When he went to get a hamburger at a drive-in, he was refused service. Later, when driving back to Fort Benning from Birmingham, he would be flagged down by a racist Alabama state trooper who told him, boy, you ain't smart enough to be around here. You better get going. As Powell described it, I regarded military installations in the South as healthy cells in an otherwise sick body. By the way, when the Civil Rights Act was enacted in 1964, Powell went back to that drive-in to get his hamburger. On April 16, 1965, Powell's daughter, Linda, was born. He was also now a major. In less than eight years, he had received a rank normally achieved only after a decade of service. He was advancing rapidly up the challenging Army career slope. While at Fort Benning, Powell would sadly hear that one of his closest buddies in the Pershing Rifles, Tony Mufrodis, had been killed in Vietnam. He also knew he would eventually return to combat there. But first, in 1967, he would head to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas to attend the Command and General Staff College, graduating second in his class. While at Fort Leavenworth, Powell would see on TV in February of 1968, finding at the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, signaling the beginning of the Tet Offensive. Resistance to American involvement in Vietnam has also Accelerate, accelerated at home. Even worse, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4 in Memphis. Just days before King was killed, President Johnson dropped out of the upcoming presidential election. That fall would see increasing protests in America against the Vietnam conflict, as well as racial tensions escalating. In late July of 1968, Powell headed back to Vietnam. He arrived at Duc Phu in the South Central Coast region. He was now an executive officer of an infantry battalion in what was known as the AmeriCal Division. Powell observed there were good men in the AmeriCal Division, but at this juncture of the conflict, they lacked inspiration and a sense of purpose. In addition, Bases like Duck Fo were increasingly divided by the same racial polarization that had begun to plague America during the 60s. On November 22, 1968, Alma received an alarming telegram in Birmingham. It told her that Powell had been involved in a helicopter crash. He had pulled survivors from the wrecked helicopter, including his injured division commander, Major General Charles Geddes. He did all this on a broken ankle which was in a cast for a week and then wrapped in an ace bandage. After being warned by the doctors that it was being foolish, Powell observed that the ankle healed in about seven years. Powell's second tour of duty in Vietnam ended in July of 1969. He had received the Legion of Merit as well as the Soldier's Medal for his role in rescuing survivors from the helicopter crash the previous year. As noted earlier, he est had estimated it would take a half a million men. Six years later, there were almost 550,000 American soldiers in Vietnam, and it was still not enough. As Powell astutely summed it up, quote, in Vietnam, we had entered into a half-hearted half-war and with much of the nation opposed or indifferent, while a small fraction carried the burden, unquote. That sobering assessment would haunt and guide him in his later military and civilian career.
Just before leaving Vietnam, Powell received notice that he had been accepted for the School of Government and Business Administration at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Hanging up his uniform temporarily, he now pursued an MBA degree. At 32 years of age, he was often the oldest in his classes and found the subjects daunting. But he managed to survive and even thr thrive in his course work. On May 20, 1970, the Powell's second daughter, Anna Marie, was born. He was then promoted two months later to Lieutenant Colonel. Versus the standard 20 years, he had achieved that rank in only 12 years. The following April, in his last semester at graduate school, Powell would witness a shocking sight. A protest by over 200,000 demonstrators against the conflict in Vietnam at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Those demonstrators included Vietnam veterans against the war who flung their medals and ribbons at the building. While he understood their bitterness, Powell's heart could never be with these demonstrators. For him, he still believed in, Amer in America where medals ought to be a source of pride. Powell graduated in May of 1971 with his MBA degree. Although urged to go for his PhD, he was eager to get back to his Army career. He ended up at the Pentagon working as a research analyst. In November, Powell was asked to apply for a White House fellowship and was accepted in the OMB during the Nixon administration. That would bring him briefly into contact with two individuals who would become important in his future career the director of OMB, Caspar Weinberger, and his deputy, Frank Carlucci. When Weinberger and Carlucci moved on, Fred Malik became deputy director of the OMB. As a White House fellow, Powell worked under Malik as his special assistant. As he stated it, I learned much in Professor Malik's graduate seminar. At the end of his White House fellowship, Malik asked him to stay on, but Powell wanted to return to the Army. In 1973, Powell became the commander of a battalion in the 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. The commander of the 2nd Infantry was Major General Henry Emerson, better known as the Gunfighter. He got that nickname from carrying a cowboy-style six-shooter rather than a regulation 45 caliber pistol. Emerson was a gung-ho motivational leader for his troops in the 2nd Infantry. Powell described it as a tough command where morale and discipline needed much improvement. In transitioning from the draft to volunteers, drugs, racial tension, and indiscipline plagued the Army in Korea. Emerson was determined to turn around this slack, demoralized operation. That included group motivational exercises called combat sports based upon football and even basketball. Juxtaposed to Emerson was the assistant division commander, Brigadier General Harry Brooks. Brooks was the first black general under whom Powell served directly. Brooks became the flywheel that provided stability, coolness, and common sense to Emerson's laudable energy that could have torn the division apart. Even with their different personalities, Powell loved, admired, and learned from both men. Unlike white officers in non-coms who might not crack down on recalcitrant blacks for fear of being labeled racist, Powell had no such qualms. As he saw it, among the blacks I had some of the finest soldiers and NCOs I have known who found in the army a freedom in which they could fulfill themselves. He did not like seeing their proud performance, performance tarnished by nihilistic types, a minority within a minority. Instead, he wanted to care for them positively. So did Emerson with all his excesses. For promoting racial tolerance, his favorite tool was the 1970 film, 
Brian's song. Briefly, this film is about the friendship that developed between the football players, Gail Sayers, a black from the north, and Brian Piccolo, a white from the south. After playing the movie, the men were then led in a discussion of the issues it raised. As Powell noted, the movie and the discussion that followed was an effective tool. As his time in Korea was reaching its end in 1974, Emerson wanted Powell to extend his tour of duty. But the pull of his family from which he had been separated from many months prevailed. So did his next assignment, a coveted one at the National War College, or NWC, known as the Harvard of Military Education. Powell left Korea and returned stateside in September of 1974. In attending the NWC, he entered the big leagues of the American military. Because the NWC was at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C., it also meant his family could remain in their home in nearby Northern Virginia. With the Vietnam conflict winding down, Powell saw much soul searching at the NWC NWC on how to correct and not repeat that sad experience. In February of 1976, he got an accelerated promotion to full colonel, reflective of his assignment at, to the NWC. He also received more welcome news that his next assignment would be with the 101st Airborne, the famous Screaming Eagles, at Fort Campbell in Kentucky. With a bit of juggling on his part, Powell was able to graduate from the NWC as well as move on to the 101st Airborne. He would command the 2nd Brigade, but was rudely informed by the assistant division commander that it was the worst in the 101st. So while the other two brigades went off to Germany, Powell decided to improve 2nd Brigade's esprit de corps by getting himself and as many of his officers and men as possible qualified at Air Assault School. As added incentive, only those officers who qualified would be included in a group picture later. Needless to say, all of them did. From his experience earlier in Korea, Powell was highly sensitive to the Army's racial environment. While not achieving perfect racial harmony, what he saw at Fort Campbell was a significant improvement. He attributed that primarily to the Army being an all-volunteer system. The current recruits, white or black, were doing well in everything, including race relations, mostly because they were better educated and in the Army by choice. Nonetheless, he recruited a top-notch equal opportunity NCO to make sure things stayed that way. Powell had hoped to stay with the 101st Airborne to become its chief of staff, but he was asked in February of 1977 to interview for a position in the National Security Council. Zygmunt Brzezinski, the current National Security Advisor, wanted him to manage the NSC's defense program staff. Although flattered, Powell initially declined. Even so, Brzezinski persisted. But instead of joining the NSC, Powell wound up spending two and a half years in the office of the Secretary of Defense for the Carter administration. By the way, Powell had voted for Carter as president. He started working with John Kester, the special assistant to the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of Defense. In mid-1979, Powell would be tapped temporarily as an executive assistant to Secretary Charles Duncan of the newly formed Department of Energy before returning to the Defense Department. After a trip to Tehran in October of 1978, Powell learned in December he was being promoted to Brigadier General, another significant milestone in his military career. But in January of 1979, the Shah was driven out of Iran to be replaced by the 
I told a Kohamini. In November of 1979, the American embassy in Tehran was overrun and its occupants taken hostage. The Carter administration faced a crisis of monumental proportions. That crisis only got worse on April 24, 1980. Powell and other Americans were stunned to learn the Carter administration had aborted an attempt known as Desert One to rescue those hostages. Based upon his extensive experience of helicopter operations in Vietnam, Powell was surprised at the way this operation had been conceived and conducted. Desert One was a disaster of poor planning and technical failures, costing the lives of eight military personnel. Powell also rightly felt that the handling of this affair had been a public communications fiasco. The sad experience of Desert One would not be forgotten by him in handling future crisis situations. Powell also was correct in stating that this failure may well have fatally wounded the Carter presidency. In November of 1980, Ronald Reagan, who he now voted for, was elected handily as president. He would work with the Reagan transition team that included two members he knew from his prior experience at OMB. One was Casper Weinberger, who would become Reagan's Secretary of Defense. The other was Frank Carlucci, who would become Weinberger's deputy. When Carlucci asked him to be his assistant, Powell accepted. But Powell still yearned for military command. In the spring of 1981, he became assistant commander of the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Collins. Two years later, he was back at Fort Leavenworth, now as a deputy commander of the Combined Arms Combat Development Activity, later to be promoted to Major General. While at Fort Leavenworth, his wife Alma suggested he needed a haircut. Powell went to the local black barber who introduced himself as Old Sarge. When Powell thumbed through a red covered diary that Old Sarge asked him to sign, he discovered a surprise. His name was already there as a major in 1968 when he was first posted at Fort Leavenworth. Powell then learned Old Sarge's real name, Gelester Linton, former member of the 10th Cavalry, AKA the Buffalo Soldiers. As Powell observed, he was not only reading black military history, he was shaking its hand. When asked if Fort Leavenworth had a commemoration for the Buffalo Soldiers, Linton mentioned 9th and 10th Cavalry Avenues. But when out jogging one day past but when jogging one day past an intersection of gravel roads, Powell was upset to discover a leaning, weather-beaten street sign marking 9th Cavalry Avenue and another marking 10th Cavalry Avenue. As Powell accurately characterized it, such a dismal set of markers wasn't the best we could do to honor the memory of those men. Getting an appropriate memorial to the Buffalo Soldiers became his personal crusade. Through Powell's persistence, an appropriate monument to the Buffalo Soldiers at Fort Leavenworth finally became a reality 10 years later. By late summer of 1983, Powell left Fort Leffenworth and was back as senior military assistant under Secretary of Defense Weinberger. In October, there was the bombing of a U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, killing over 240 soldiers. Soon to follow that same month was the invasion of Grenada, characterized by Powell as a sloppy success to protect almost 1,000 American medical students when the head of the Marxist regime there, Maurice Bishop, was assassinated. But the most significant American foreign affairs matter of that time would span two widely separated regions of the globe. 
The Middle East, specifically Iran and the American hostages still held there, and Central America, involving the guerrilla war between the Contra militants and the revolutionary Sandinistas in Nicaragua. What became known as the Iran-Contra affair would eventually ensnare the Reagan administration in a huge political scandal. The Iran-Contra affair originally started with the proposed sale of arms through Israel to Iran in exchange for the release of the American hostages. But this proposed sale orchestrated by then NSA Robert McFarlane was contrary to Reagan's existing arms embargo against Iran. So far that arms embargo had failed to secure the release of the hostages. Upon learning of the proposed arms sale to Iran, Weinberger vigorously opposed it. As accurately described by Powell, that proposed sale was a bad idea. The eventual scheme then changed to a proposed transfer of arms from existing Pentagon stockpiles to the CIA for secret shipment to Iran. In January of 1986, Admiral Poindexter, who had succeeded McFarlane as the NSA, obtained Reagan's authorization for this covert sale. As characterized by Powell, that covert sale might be foolhardy, but it was at least legal. So Weinberger asked Powell to arrange for this transfer of arms to the CIA. Powell also warned Poindexter in a memo that Congress needed to be notified of this covert sale. But as was sadly learned later, Powell failed to do, Point, excuse me, Poindexter failed to do so. The covert sale of arms to Iran was awkward enough for the Reagan administration. Where this covert sale went truly rogue and illegal was what happened to the funds received from Iran for those arms. Previously, Reagan wanted to help the Contra militants fighting the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. But Congress had enacted a law known as the Second Boland Amendment that prohibited funding to the Contras without its consent. Even so, Poindexter, through his brash subordinate, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver Knorr, diverted funds from the Iran arms sales to the Contras. In later congressional hearings, there was a heated debate as to whether this diversion by the NSC was subject to the second Boland Amendment. Nonetheless, the cover-up and scandal from this arms for hostages scheme resulted in a number of criminal indictments that included Weinberger, McFarlane, Poindexter, and North. Powell's limited role in the Iran-Contra affair was subsequently found to be blameless. His memo to Poindexter warning of the need to notify Congress of the covert sale likely helped in absolving him of responsibility for any wrongdoing. He certainly had no knowledge of the subsequent diversion of funds to the Contras. In 1986, Powell was promoted to Lieutenant General and headed back to West Germany in June to command V Corps and 75,000 men. Ironically, his military career began in West Germany almost 28 years earlier. His progress up the military hierarchy so far had been phenomenal, especially for an African American. The Soviet Union was still the primary adversary but the feared Russian bear was mellowing under the reform policies of Glasnost and Perestroika of Mikhail Gorbachev. Even so, the mission of Fifth Corps was no different from that when Powell was last in West Germany almost three decades ago. Defending against the Red Army was still Fifth Corps' primary mission. Powell's time as commander of Fifth Corps would be short-lived. Back across the Atlanta, the Iran-Contra affair began unraveling as America's covert arms sale to Iran became public. Poindexter resigned as the NSA to be replaced by Carlucci. Reagan had just been re-elected for his second term when the Iran-Contra affair exploded into public view. 
The Reagan administration, and especially the NSC, was becoming mired in the resulting scandal. Carlucci pleaded with Powell to come back to his come back as his deputy to help him clean up the terrible mess created by his predecessors. Powell initially refused. But Reagan then called him, President Reagan then called him, telling him he needed Powell to help Carlucci straighten out the mess at the NSC. Like the true soldier he was, Powell replied, yes, sir, I'll do it. Reagan thanked him, saying, God bless you. In January of 1987, Powell was back in the U.S. to help Carlucci return order to the NSC after it had gone off the rails. In late February, the Tower Commission released its report on the Iran-Contra affair. It was extremely critical of Reagan's hands-off management style, which had allowed the NSC to go rogue. Based on that report, Carlucci bluntly told Reagan that the NSC SC advised presidents, but it did not run wars or covert strategies. Then tragedy struck the Powell household in late June. Michael, now an army lieutenant in Germany, had been involved in an almost fatal Jeep accident. What followed were numerous painful reconstructive surgeries that allowed Michael to at least walk with the aid of a cane. But sadly, his military career was now over. In November, Weinberger resigned as Secretary of Defense in the wake of the Iran-Contra scandal. His replacement was Carlucci. That led to Powell being appointed as the new NSA, the first African American to hold that position. To alleviate concern about Powell being an active duty military officer, he picked John Negroponte a career foreign service officer as his deputy. On June 12, 1987, at the Brandenburg Gate in front of the Berlin Wall, President Reagan threw down the gauntlet before Gorbachev by asking him to tear down this wall. The situation between the two global powers remained tense as they tried to see their way through to limit the nuclear arms race between them. As the NSA, Powell became heavily involved in that issue. In December of 1987, Gorbachev would travel to Washington, D.C. for the first time for his third summit with Reagan on nuclear arms control. After many contentious discussions, Gorbachev agreed to compromise on limiting nuclear weapons. As Powell characterized it, the world continued to become a safer place. Vice President Bush was elected in November of 1988 to succeed Reagan as president. Powell resisted suggestions to be Bush's running mate as vice president. He told Reagan he wanted to return to the Army to head FORSCOM, the United States Army Forces Command. Before leaving the presidency, Reagan granted Powell's request, as well as promoting him to the highest rank of four-star general, the second African-American to hold that rank. The end of the over 40-year Cold War between America and the Soviet Union was literally the result of a thunderous crash. On November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall, which I had personally and depressingly seen in 1970, almost 20 years before that time, was torn down by the East Germans. The Soviet Union of Gorbachev now began to unravel. That was soon to be followed by the disintegration of the Warsaw Pact. Indeed, German reunification occurred when East Germany left the PAC in 1990. When Bush became president in January of 1989, General Powell would soon take up the reins of FORSCOM, which controlled over a million American soldiers worldwide. But that was a short-lived assignment. Dick Cheney, who had known Powell when he was the NSA, 
was Bush's Secretary of Defense. Cheney recommended to Bush that Powell be appointed Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to replace the retiring Admiral William Crowell, Jr. Bush agreed, and in October, Powell became Chairman of the JCS. He was the youngest as well as the first African American to hold that position. After becoming Chairman, General Powell would receive in December a letter of congratulations from a former compatriot in Vietnam, Captain Vo Kong Hu. After spending 13 years in a communist re-education camp, Hu and his wife were about to emigrate to the U.S. Powell would help out his old friend by arranging for the rest of Hu's family to enter. Around a year and a half later, while making a speech in Minneapolis, Powell would have an emotional reunion when he spotted Hugh in the crowd. Powell brought Hugh forward and told the crowd, quote, I ran into an old friend here, one I haven't seen for nearly 30 years. I want you to meet him, a new neighbor of yours and a new American, unquote. A bewildered Hugh then rose to thunderous applause. There were two notable crises General Powell would deal with during his tenure as chairman of the JCS. The first was removing the notorious Panamanian dictator, Manuel Noriega, who had been indicted in the U.S. for drug smuggling. Powell preferred getting rid of Noriega by negotiated agreement to install Panama's democratically elected president, Guillermo Endera. But Noriega's resistance, as well as the death of a Marine officer at the hands of his Panamanian Defense Force, known as the PDF, pushed Powell to use military action. He now oversaw the operation known as Just Cause to defeat the PDF, to depose Noriega, install Indira, and bring Noriega back to the U.S. for trial on the drug charges. Just Cause commenced on December 20, 1989. It was Powell's first application of his quick and decisive force military strategy to ensure success and minimize American losses. The American troops crushed the PDF within days, suffering less than 350 casualties while ensuring the installation of Indira as the lawfully elected president of Panama. After going temporarily into hiding, the deposed Noriega surrendered on January 3, 1990. The second involved Saddam Hussein's Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in August of 1990. That was the first time I recall even hearing of General Powell. It was also when I heard him describe his quick and decisive force military strategy. As it applied to Desert Storm, the operation to evict the Iraqi army from Kuwait, Pal stated it succinctly and forcefully in a January 23, 1991 press briefing. Quote, our strategy in going after this army is very simple. First, we're gonna cut it off and then we're gonna kill it, unquote. The decision to execute that cut off and kill it military strategy was arrived at only after Powell addressed eight questions. Those eight questions developed from America's unsatisfactory experience in Korea and especially Vietnam conflicts were commonly referred to as the Powell Doctrine. Only if each of those eight questions was answered with a yes would military action be justified in Powell's view. Execution in January of the resulting cut off and kill it military strategy by the American led coalition was fairly swift and decisive. A 42 day air bombing campaign isolated and paralyzed the Iraqi army in Kuwait. The resulting ground campaign led by General Norman Schwarzkopf took a mere four days to devastate what remained and send it fleeing back to Iraq. Upwards of a mind-boggling 35,000 Iraqi soldiers were killed, 
compared to American deaths of less than 150. As Powell observed, all of us in uniform have been solidly backed by civilian leaders at the State Department, the Pentagon, and the White House. He also noted most deserving of praise was President Bush, who thoroughly backed him and the others involved in Desert Storm. George C. Scott once said in the movie Patton, all good things must eventually come to an end. At the conclusion of his second term as chairman of the JCS in 1993, General Powell would step down. His epic 35-year military career was now over. In retirement, Powell wrote his autobiography, which is quite good and which I've used extensively in this talk. In it, he discusses his balanced view on affirmative action. That view may surprise some, but I completely agree with it, especially on avoiding undermining what minority Americans achieve on their own merits. Quote, equal rights and equal opportunity, however, mean just that. They do not mean preferential treatment. Preferences, no matter how well intended, ultimately breed resentment among the non-preferred. And preferential treatment demeans the achievements that minority Americans can win by their own efforts, unquote. At the request of President Clinton, Powell was the U.S. representative in May of 1994 for the historic inauguration of Nelson Mandela as the first black president of South Africa. Amongst other philanthropic activities, he became a member of the Board of Trustees of Howard University in Washington, D.C., a notable historically black university. After Desert Storm and before stepping down as chairman, Powell worked with Defense Secretary Cheney to restructure the American military in light of the end of the Cold War. Although he was certainly the role model of what an African American could achieve in the American military, he also had to contend with other African Americans who were not supportive of his high position in that military. In response, General Powell would echo the words of President Bush stated on February 25, 1990, quote, to those who question the proportion of blacks in the armed services, my answer is simple. The military of the United States is the greatest equal opportunity employer around. Unquote. General Powell's retirement would also prove to be temporary. He had now become close friends, close and valued friend of the Bush family. Seven years later, Texas Governor George W. Bush would narrowly win the 2000 presidential election. He wanted Powell to be his Secretary of State. So in 2001, he became Bush's, Bush 43 Secretary of State the first African-American to hold that position. Bush 43's vice president was Dick Cheney. Cheney and Powell had gotten along well during Bush 41's administration and even became friends. But that was not to be during the Bush 43 administration. Given Bush 43's lack of experience in, in foreign policy, Cheney would become a dominant player on such issues, which should have been left to Powell as Secretary of State. That would result in a steady weakening and later rupture of the prior cordial relationship between these two men. With the Cold War becoming a distant memory, the Middle East generally, and Iraq specifically, would become the major foreign policy problem for Powell as Secretary of State. I, as well as many other Americans, saw on TV with horror the terrorist attack by Al-Qaeda on September 11, 2001, which brought down the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. Powell was abroad when it happened and soon returned home to deal with the aftermath of 911. As Secretary of State, Powell would skillfully organize an international coalition to oust 
at least temporarily, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan that supported and hosted Al-Qaeda. But America's recent adversary, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, were again causing serious mischief in the Middle East. There was also concern that Hussein, who had used chemical weapons against the Kurds during the 1988 Iraq-Iran War, was stockpiling not only those weapons of mass destruction, but also other WMDs that included biological agents and even potentially nuclear weapons. As I related in last year's talk, the fear that Hussein had retained such WMDs was reasonable. With that fear in mind, Bush 43, as well as Cheney pushed for aggressive and even military action against Hussein. But Powell, as Secretary of State, was extremely hesitant to use military force, which he always viewed as a last resort in applying the Powell Doctrine. Instead, he proposed a diplomatic approach within the United Nations to gain greater international support. Unfortunately for Powell, the supposed evidence he presented to the UN supporting the existence of such WMDs was based upon speculation as well as suspect CIA intelligence. He also failed to obtain overwhelming UN support to attack Hussein in Iraq. Nonetheless, on March 19, 2003, the US with limited support from Great Britain began the operation known as Iraqi Freedom. In 43 days, the Iraqi army was destroyed and Hussein's regime was toppled. Hussein himself was captured in December. But as observed in my talk last year, no WNDs in Hussein's supposed arsenal were turned up. Even worse, the American military force sent, while sufficient to crush the Iraqi army, was totally insufficient to deal with the resulting chaos created by toppling Hussein's regime. Powell's earlier warning about this potential problem had sadly fallen on deaf ears. As Powell would later observe, if he had known how inaccurate the CIA intelligence was, he would likely have recommended against the Iraq war. Unfortunately, in my, and in my opinion, unfairly, much of the stain and blame for this intelligence failure would fall primarily on Powell. That fact and his diminishing clout within the Bush 43 administration on foreign policy, especially as Cheney's influence on such matters continued to increase, would lead Powell to step down as Secretary of State in 2004. When Powell left the State Department, that would be the end of his work career, both military and civilian. He also declined, wisely in my view, various invitations to run for political office. Although he is good friends with Senator John McCain, Powell would endorse Senator Barack Obama for president during the 2008 presidential election. Unsurprisingly, he would again endorse President Obama for re-election in 2012. As a self-taught auto mechanic, Powell continued his hobby of restoring old Volvo cars back to life. He also wrote a book published in 2012 entitled, It Worked For Me, which contains his 13 rules and other pearls of wisdom. Time does not permit me to go through them all, but number six, don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision, has an informative illustration of his outstanding problem-solving skills, even in a crisis. When Powell was chief of the JCS, a military coup was attempted in December of 1989 in the Philippines against President Corazon Aquino. Concerned that members of the coup included the Air Force, she asked the U.S. to bomb a nearby Philippine air base. Powell's instincts suggested that would result in unnecessary deaths and other collateral damage that would be severely criticized by the Philippine people. Instead, Powell proposed using F-4 Phantoms from nearby Clark Air Base to buzz that Philippine air base in a manner demonstrating extreme hostile intent. 
If any Philippine plane started down the runway, the F-4s were to shoot in front of it or crater the runway. They would shoot down the plane only if it took off. Needless to say, those Philippine planes stayed on the ground and the coup ended. The Philippine Minister of Defense, of Defense Fidel Ramos, would later gratefully thank Powell for wisely not bombing the airbase. In conclusion, I've hopefully given you at least an overview of Powell's exceptional military and civilian career that spanned over four decades. The number of civilian awards Powell received is vast, including two Presidential Medals of Freedom, the President's Citizens Medal, the Congressional Gold Medal, the Secretary of State Distinguished Service Medal, the Secretary of Energy Distinguished Service Medal, and the Ronald Reagan Freedom Award. Powell has always viewed his role to be a problem solver and a motivator of the people who worked for him and with him. The comparison of his career to that of General Mar George Marshall is apt, especially in terms of his impact on America, its military, and its foreign policy. More importantly, he is a role model, not just for African Americans, but for all Americans. If you want to know more about General Colin Powell, definitely check out his autobiography, My American Journey. His book, It Worked For Me, which I previously mentioned, is a must read for its sage advice and amusing anecdotes. I've also listed a condensed biography, Colin Powell, Soldier and Statement, Statesman, that covers Powell's entire career, as well as a book, The Great Rift, which discusses the collaboration of, as well as the rupture in the relationship between Powell and Cheney. That's it for my talk today. Here's my contact information in case you're interested. Thanks for watching and God bless.